Hello, welcome to the Macular Degeneration Association's series. Today's talk is talking about cataract surgery and macular degeneration. We'd like to welcome everyone and thank our sponsors, Regeneron, Novartis, and No Television for their support of our virtual programs. We did want to do a little bit of uh, housekeeping first thing. We want to let you know that there uh, will be a, a survey available to you approximately three minutes to complete. It will automatically pop up as after the end of this program. If you could take the time to fill that out, it would be greatly appreciated. It helps us to develop these programs and uh, get uh, subject matter that uh, everyone finds interesting and helpful in their day-to-day -day lives. We do still have many more programs stretching all the way to the beginning of December. So if you'd like to register for any of those, please go to our website, macularhope.org, where you can find uh, the sign-up sheets for each of those programs. So please take a few minutes to do that and see what other information you'd like to learn from us. Um, one quick uh, topic is the question and answers that will come after each of the talks. Please do not raise your hands. Uh, please put all of your questions into the Q&A chat box, as this will be the only way that your questions will be answered. All right, moving forward. We have a, a wonderful speaker for you today. Uh, Dr. Paul Ajamian is a graduate of the University of Vermont and the New England College of Optometry. He completed a two-year fellowship at the renowned Bascom Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, Florida. He was instrumental in starting the nation's first true co-management practice in 1982, then called the VEF Educational and Diagnostic Center. Since 1984, Dr. Ajamian has served as Center Director of Omni Eye Services of Atlanta and has mentored many doctors that have started centers modeled after Omni. In 1995, Dr. Ajamian was chosen as the optometric of the South, optometrist of the South, excuse me, by his peers, and in 2000 was voted one of the 10 optometrists of the decade by Optometric Management Magazine and its readers. In 2014, Dr. Ajamian received the Distinguished Service Award the highest honor for lifetime achievement bestowed by the American Optometric Association. And in June, 2015, Dr. Paul Ajamian was inducted into the National Optometry Hall of Fame. It's a pleasure to uh, introduce you now to Dr. Ajamian. You have our attention. Dusty, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you who are on the Zoom call. I know this has become kind of a normal way of life for us and for me as a speaker and it's uh still a little bit odd to stare into a screen and uh not be able to see the audience but uh you know it is the new way of life so we will go through about uh 45 or 50 minutes of material and then take questions that you can type into the chat box and we will answer those at the end. But hopefully I will answer a bunch of them as we go. My topic, and I noticed the incredible lineup of speakers coming uh, over the next two months, uh, basically dissecting the macula, also known as the center of the retina, and looking at topics such as diabetes and low vision aids to help with reduced vision and other topics related to macular degeneration. Uh, but today's topic relates more to cataract surgery and how it interfaces with the disease that we all know as macular degeneration or age-related macular degeneration. AMD or ARMD. So the goal of my talk is to basically take a look at modern day cataract surgery and to talk about the effects of macular degeneration on the eye and how that relates to the need for cataract surgery. So if I have macular degeneration and I have cataracts, am I a candidate for cataract surgery or not? And we will answer
answer all of those questions as we go. Um, if I have cataract surgery, will that accelerate the macular degeneration process? And in other words, does cataract surgery make macular degeneration worse? First, let's give a brief overview of cataract surgery. Uh, obviously, not everybody is eligible to have cataracts. Dusty and I were talking before the program about whether everyone is born with a cataract. Well, we're all born with a crystalline lens or a human lens that sits behind the colored part of the eye, the iris, and that lens focuses light onto the all important retina. And I will go over some of the anatomy of that coming up. But if the cataract is very early in its development and it doesn't cause reduction in visual acuity, it doesn't cause glare problems, it doesn't cause a lifestyle complaint, meaning difficulty driving at night or difficulty with reading or sewing or knitting or doing whatever you like to do and need to do, then insurance typically will not pay for it. The density of the cataract, in other words, how we as doctors look at the progression of the cataract is probably the least important factor. But lifestyle complaint and how it's affecting your life along with the glare that it can cause are two very important factors in determining whether insurance will pay for the procedure and typically it will. So here's that eye anatomy picture that I talked to you about and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this. But if you look at the area highlighted in yellow, it's pointing to the human lens. And you can see here that this lens is very clear, just like a brand new pair of eyeglasses or a very clear windshield on a car that you just bought. However, with time, and if those glasses are your favorites and you're hanging on to them for 20 or 30 years and they become scratched and yellowed, or that car becomes your favorite car and you hang on to it for 20 or 30 years and it becomes scratched and yellowed and dirty, then you're looking through uh, that cloudy surface that impairs your vision. Similarly, when light is focused here through the pupil of the eye, through a cloudy lens, light will be scattered in every which direction rather than being focused very nicely on the fovea, which is really the center of the macula, which is the general center of the retina. So you can see here that we went from clear to cloudy, <laughs> clear to cloudy. And that clouding dramatically affects the perception of colors as well. And it happens so slowly that you really don't know that it's happening. And people that come into us with advanced cataracts uh, will say in some situations, really, I'm doing fine. I don't know why my doctor sent me in for cataract surgery. And then after they have surgery, they realize the difference and that it was happening so slowly that they really didn't even know what was being taken away from them. The beauty of cataract surgery compared to other types of surgery in the eye from the cornea to the vitreous, which is the gel that fills the eye to the retina, is that any <clears throat> vision loss that occurs from a cataract is in most cases completely reversible. So let's move on to probably the old days, which is when I started practice. And the mantra back then was you really wouldn't recommend cataract surgery for anyone until the cataract got ripe. And what does that mean? Well, ripe meant very advanced, very cloudy. So an eyeglass lens or a windshield that not only had a little dirt and scratches on it, but that you spray painted with 
gray or brown paint. And of course, you're not able to see through that, but that would be the indicator back in the 70s and 80s to do surgery because the surgery was extremely, compared to modern day, barbaric, if you will. An incision was made from about the 10 o'clock point uh, of the cornea right here, all the way up and around and all the way over to two o'clock. And the thing that's uh, so interesting about that is that because you're opening up the eye so significantly and having to put in multiple stitches to close the eye, that that was a very precarious situation and people were left in the hospital for anywhere from three days to two weeks sometimes back in the 50s and 60s with sandbags surrounding their heads so that they couldn't move and pop one of those stitches, which could be disastrous. So that's why the, and, and, and it still carries forward to today, that's why people waited until the cataract got right. Now with modern day surgery, it is, so uh, much better, a small incision is made in the cornea and we will see that in one of the videos and there are no stitches and you can certainly do surgery well before you're walking into walls and not able to see anything. There are a variety of types of cataracts and the aging form of cataract is on the bottom left of your screen Hopefully you can see my little arrow moving around. You see the brownish and the yellowish coloration of the lens. Again, that's the analogy of trying to look through eyeglasses or a windshield after pouring dirty 10W40 oil after an oil change on it. And you're not gonna um, see colors well, you are gonna see something, but a lot of shadows and nothing certainly in high definition. There's a slightly different form of cataract that we see in younger patients called milky nuclear sclerosis on the top slide. You can see an early example of that. And on the bottom right slide, slide a significant example of this kind of whitish milky appearance to the center of the lens, the human lens, and that part is called the nucleus. So thus the term nuclear sclerosis. Regardless of the type of cataract, uh, these are opacities that need to be removed and a lens implant put in its place. So how does this interact uh, with the rest of the eye? Well, remember that this is just one structure. And even when light is passing through a clear lens, if it's focused on the back of the eye where the individual has some kind of issue, uh, whether it's macular degeneration or an old hemorrhage or a retinal detachment, that light is nice and clearly being focused onto the back of an eye that is not at its full function. So everything sort of has to be working together. The fovea, again, to go over terms, is just the very center, the bullseye of the target that is the macula, which is the center of the retina. When you move away from the center of the retina toward your what sees, uh, what is responsible for peripheral vision up here and down here, uh, you are still seeing, but it's not as clear, and you don't see colors as vividly. All of that is happening uh, back here in the fovea and the macula. There are three layers to the eye. The retina is the inner layer. The sandwich material in between the two pieces of bread, which is the sclera and the retina, is a layer called the choroid, and that's a blood vessel layer that really plays into macular degeneration that I'll touch on because other speakers are gonna go into that in future weeks in depth, but that blood vessel layer nourishes the retina and is responsible for the health of that inner retinal layer um, called the retina. 
Now, the sclera is the tough outer white coating of the eye that protects the rest of the eye. So when you look at someone and you see their white eye, that's actually the structure called the sclera. And then of course, there are millions of little nerve fibers that are lining the retina, about a million uh, actually total, that all collect in the main trunk called the optic nerve. That optic nerve then turns those light signals uh, into nerve signals that are communicating with the brain and we interpret uh, what we see through this miracle, basically, of the eye and vision. And it truly is a miracle that it all works together like it does. So what is macular degeneration? Again, we know that the macula is the center of the retina. You wish that macular degeneration was called peripheral retinal degeneration. And that way, it might affect your side vision a little bit, but it wouldn't affect what you see straight ahead. But unfortunately, it does affect the bullseye right in the middle of the eye. It's a disease that we don't fully understand. We know that it's becoming more prevalent with as boomers age in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. We know that it's a degenerative condition that affects all layers of the retina, including the photoreceptors and something called the retinal pigment epithelium, which is the base layer of the retina. And that there are two forms. There's the dry form, which is typically quoted and accurately to affect 90% of people. And then there's the wet form that affects 10%. And some of these numbers can be 80, 20, 90, 10, depends on the studies that you read. But of all the severe vision loss that occurs in macular degeneration, much of it happens within this wet or neovascular category. And what happens here? Well, in the dry form, you have these uh, deposits called drusen. They're little whitish yellow um, accumulations of material that can eventually thin the retina and disrupt it. But it typically doesn't lead to any kind of blood vessel formation. In the wet form, the thinning of the retina occurs to the point where that sandwich, middle of the sandwich layer that I told you is uh, called the choroid, those blood vessels want to get through any little cracks in a degenerative retina, almost like a crack in a plastic flower pot. And before you know it, a root has found its way out through that crack. Well, these blood vessels find their way into the retina. They're very fragile blood vessels. And while they're trying to do good, they really do nothing but harm. And the blood vessels can break and bleed and cause a hemorrhage right in the center of the retina that you see here. And that can be disastrous. It can lead to what's called a discoform hemorrhage where you not only have a large amount of blood, but also lipid from the blood which results in scar formation that really often leads to permanent central vision loss. And when we talk about reduced vision from macular degeneration, the good news is that this has not affected the periphery so that most patients, even with the worst of central wet macular degeneration, can still get around okay using their peripheral vision uh, and they will never, ever go completely blind in terms of total darkness, which is what we think of when we think of the term blindness. So it is the most common cause of severe vision loss in older individuals, and it's on the rise, unfortunately. But luckily, we've got some things to combat it, and that's the hope throughout this entire series is that there are more and more medications that are being used that compared to what we had in the old days, namely do nothing or laser the area, kind of spot weld it, um, it does bring us hope.
but the numbers are on the rise over the next five years. There are a number of risk factors. Uh, none of us can control our age or our gender. We can control uh, high blood pressure and the lower the blood pressure, it seems the lower the risk for macular degeneration. People with lighter complexions and lighter irises, namely blue eyes versus brown are at slightly higher risk and smoking as with everything related to the body and health issues can increase the risk for macular degeneration. So some of those things we have control over, the high blood pressure and the smoking in particular. What are some symptoms? Well, early on, it could just be, my vision just isn't quite as clear and I'm going to read things and it just seems kind of blurry. Uh, it could be that there's a distortion of what you're seeing called metamorphopsia. So you look at a, a checkerboard and it's got some wavy lines to it. A scotoma is a blind spot and it can also cause pieces of your central vision to be missing. Uh, that all being said can result in problems with driving, with reading, et cetera. Or you can have very early macular degeneration with those drusen in the dry form that don't affect the very central part of the retina. And so you have absolutely no symptoms, asymptomatic. That's a possibility as well. So here's somebody looking at some buildings in the distance. And here's that scotoma or blind spot that I'm talking about that happens right in the central vision. You can still see around it, but everything you look directly at is blurred out. How does all of this affect uh, vision and how does that equate to the numbers that we as eye doctors use every day from 2020 to 2200? Well, 2040 uh, or better, you're typically functioning fine. You're able to drive. You're able to read uh, relatively small newsprint. If the vision becomes worse than that on up to 2080, you're probably going to have difficulty reading large print. And if it's worse than 2200, which is the big E on, the, on most eye doctors' charts, that's the definition uh, in most states of legal blindness, making it difficult to recognize people, to read signs, to drive, and to live independently. Here's an example of what it can do in the real world, um, looking at cars in an intersection, it can be very dangerous to drive, and then looking at uh, print, and seeing that the letters are distorted, bent, blurred, uh, all of these things can be the effect of macular degeneration. What's the natural course of macular degeneration if you just left it alone, you went on a desert island and let's see what happens. Well, there's a significant chance of severe vision loss. Uh, there's also a chance that the other eye will become involved. And, you know, again, there are a lot of statistics. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of statistics because it's really the individual that we're counseling every day, but it does help us to know that if someone has uh, macular degeneration, the wet form in one eye, that they have a 40% chance of developing it in the other eye over five years, and that we're going to have to watch that, that other eye and watch both eyes very, very carefully. And this is a little bit of an older slide, but uh, as the population ages, more people will have wet macular degeneration, seven and a half million in developed countries uh, by 2020. And often that was a prediction in probably 2018. I'm not sure that statistics are quite up to date, especially with the pandemic. 
treatment for macular degeneration. The dry form, if you meet certain criteria and your eye doctor can tell you this, you qualify for, based on the ARED study, uh, the macular degeneration and vitamin supplement study that has been going on for years and was updated a few years ago. Uh, there's going to be more talk of this in the, in, uh, the upcoming series. And I'm far from an expert in macular degeneration or the retina. Cataract is more my specialty right at the moment. But I do know that if I qualified and based on the AREDS2 study, I could take a vitamin supplement that would lower my chance of progression that I would be taking it. In the old days, all we had for macular degeneration was to either watch people deteriorate, or if they developed a hemorrhage, we could laser it, almost like spot welding. So you have a little weak area, a blood vessel that's leaking, you spot weld it, seal the blood vessel shut, and prevent further bleeding. We quickly learned that that laser itself causes a scar that causes its own blind spot. And so it's not done uh, on a regular basis in, in 2021. What is done routinely is something called VEGF. So remember I mentioned that something is stimulating blood vessels from going from that middle layer into the retina to try to help the retina, but it's not really helping, it's hurting because those blood vessels are fragile and they can break. Well, how do you stop the body's natural signal, which is called vascular endothelial growth factor from growing those blood vessels? And the answer was discovered uh, years ago at Baskin Palmer with a cancer drug called Avastin that repressed this VEGF uh, stimulating factor. So if you tell VEGF to, to calm down and chill, the blood vessels won't grow, they won't break, they won't bleed and cause that big hemorrhage in the middle of the macula that I showed you. So we've turned to over the last 10 years, these VEGF injections that are instilled directly into the eye with a needle and that anti-VEGF medicine actually just sort of, uh, like I say, represses that vascular endothelial growth factor. Sounds great, right? Well, the problem is that it only lasts about four or five weeks, and thus every four to five to six weeks, you have to go in and get another injection. The good news is that there are a number of drugs on the horizon in phase two and three FDA studies that will last a lot longer than that. And that will be just a major victory for patients as we see those become approved over the next few years. So let's turn with that as background to cataract surgery. And the question is, if you have wet AMD and you're getting these series of injections uh, and yet you still have a cataract, and the retinal doctor's having trouble seeing in and you're having trouble seeing out because of that cloudy lens or cataract, can you have surgery? And the answer is yes, but everything has to be stable. We don't want any uh, edema or fluid in the retina. And that typically only happens after a series of injections and act actually consulting with the retinal doctor who will clear you for cataract surgery. And that communication between the cataract surgeon and the retinal doctor is, is really key. And a lot of cataract surgeons won't do surgery on a macular degeneration patient until they have been cleared uh, or examined and the retinal doctor has given the green light to cataract surgery being okay at that particular time. Uh, how does macular degeneration affect the need for cataract surgery? 
you know, you've got two separate problems. And true, even if you know that the aging change that is a cataract that we've described is affecting the vision somewhat, and the patient is realistic about the fact that once you take out the cataract, the vision will improve some, but not completely because of the other problem, the retinal problem, then it's fine to go ahead with surgery, but everybody's expectations have to be realistic. Taking out a cataract with macular degeneration doesn't do anything to the macular degeneration, doesn't make it worse if the retinal doctor, doctor has cleared you, and it certainly doesn't make the macular degeneration better. But if your vision is 2100, which is fairly significantly advanced, it could be that when you have cataract surgery, half of that vision loss is from the cataract. And so your vision will improve from 2100 to 2050 or 40, which is reading acuity and driving the difference between doing those or not. So cataracts and AMD are both aging changes and they coexist in a lot of people. If you have macular degeneration and you live long enough, you'll probably eventually develop cataracts. We all do. If you have cataracts, you may or may not develop macular degeneration. And one of the things that I didn't mention is a family history can play into that as well. So your doctor will typically ask you about that. So I know I'm repeating myself a little bit here, but the questions that come up all the time in my practice, if I have macular degeneration, can I have cataract surgery? And the answer is yes. If it's the dry form, for sure. If it's the wet form and the retinal doctor says it's stable through the period of injections that are being performed, then the answer there is yes as well. And we can usually say that it will help the vision, but the prognosis is guarded as to how much improvement you will get. Again, if we were looking at old school surgery from the 60s and 70s, we'd probably delay the surgery, but surgery is so cool and so slick and so atraumatic these days that why not go ahead with it, even if it gives you a few lines of improvement of acuity. What we do know is that it won't cause the macular degeneration to get worse. That's on its own particular path with its own mind, nothing to do with the surgery. So the answer clearly here is cataract surgery does not make macular degeneration worse. So let's talk about cataract surgery. And I know some of this print is small. I tried to make it large on most slides. There's too much here to do that. But really what this slide says is a lot of people are turning boomer age, um, which is 65 or older, 10,000 people a day. Uh, and I'm one of them. And I know that uh, it's not good enough to just say, well, if I have a cataract, I'm going to get it out and my vision will get a little bit better. Uh, assuming I don't have macular degeneration, I want the best vision I can have. And there are different options for that. There's a laser option that can eliminate slight amounts of astigmatism. And the laser is very slick. If we didn't have to charge for it, and if the laser didn't cost close to a million dollars, we'd do it on everybody. But there is a, an out-of-pocket charge for the laser-assisted cataract surgery. And this is actually a video of that that I'll show real quick. And you can see on the right-hand slide, it looks like nothing's happening, but the surgeon is preparing the area that is to be treated uh, on the lens that this yellow portion, and then preparing uh, for the laser to make the incisions in the cornea that used to be done with a blade, still are if you choose manual surgery. And then what you're gonna see is that the surgeon steps on the pedal, the laser is ready here, 
And the laser is carving a little opening in the front of the lens so that the surgeon can take that off and then get to the other material in the lens. It's now being defocused and these little uh, cubes are being formed. Basically that cloudy lens is being cut into thousands of little squares. And then the incisions are gonna be made. You can see the astigmatism incision here, the main incision where the surgeon will go in with his instruments here and a smaller incision here. And then the laser is done. So that took about 35 or 40 seconds. The patient goes from the laser room to the surgery suite. And there's a very good chance that you might have, if you choose laser assisted surgery, a red ring around your eye, which is where the contact lens docked onto the eye, created some suction and created these little hemorrhages. So while it looks horrible, uh, there's really no big deal here. Uh, we just warn people about the appearance for five to 10 days. Now the patient's in the operating room and that's the lens that has been broken up, the nucleus that I told you about, the center of the lens that was very brown or milky. And you can see that it was broken into multiple little cubes. The surgeon, our own surgeon, Dr. Lawrence Woodard, is opening up the incision, putting in this kind of gooey uh, gel into the eye to protect the back of the eye. It's called viscoelastic. And the laser made the incision here. He's just testing it to make sure it's fully open, almost like a perforation that you then completely open. And then he's going to go in with forceps and take out that front surface, almost like peeling an apple, perforating a, a circle in the skin of the apple and removing it so that you can get to the core of the apple. And he's inserting a little fluid in between the nucleus to kind of separate or hydro dissect. And then you're gonna see him go in with an instrument that basically uh, will vacuum out all those cloudy pieces and make way for room for the lens implant that will go in the exact spot that the nucleus came from. So here you can see that it's kind of a two-handed approach. He's got one instrument that's manipulating the lens and the other is vacuuming. And it's almost like a Pac-Man game where it's just gobbling up all that cloudy lens material to get it out of the way and make way for the clear lens implant. You can see he's using his left hand here to turn the lens into the mouth of this uh, irrigating, inst aspirating instrument. In, in this case, it's very easy to remove the nucleus because the laser already broke it up. If you don't have surgery with the laser, no problem. That instrument also sends out high frequency sound waves uh, called phacoemulsification or ultrasound. And that ultrasound breaks up the cataract almost like a jackhammer would break up cement on a sidewalk trying to get to a, a burst pipe down below. So you can see that he's almost done within a couple of minutes taking out all of this cloudy material. There's the last big chunk. He's flipping it, breaking it up, feeding it into the suction instrument. And again, in a matter of a couple of minutes, that cataract has been completely taken out of the picture. Very, very slick. Now, I take for granted that all surgery is like this. It really isn't. Um, he's an amazing surgeon, and he does a complete cataract case, including putting the lens implant in, in about six minutes. And there are many surgeons that take 20 or 30 or 40, even after doing it for a number of years. That's not an ideal situation. You want people in and out of the eye quickly. So what kind of lens implants do we have? We have the standard monofocal lens that corrects for distance. 
but does nothing for your up close vision and you'll need readers. You'll always have to put on readers when you go to look at something up close. But a big advance in 2019, a trifocal lens implant called the Panoptics was approved by the FDA. The eye has to be perfect in this case. It's not a good lens. And as a matter of fact, uh, I doubt anyone will, you'd find anyone that would put it in, in a patient with any kind of retinal disease, including macular degeneration. But if your eye is pristine, this lens focuses for distance, intermediate computer, and up close. And the only problem with this lens, you might say, well, why doesn't everyone get this? Because it costs out-of-pocket money that insurance, Medicare will not pay for. So this is a $3,000 to $3,500 option uh, that you have to pay for out-of-pocket. Insurance still pays for the rest of the procedure and the surgery facility fee and the anesthesia, but it will not pay a nickel of this. If you do have macular degeneration and it's fairly mild, the lens called the Vividy can be a nice compromise. It corrects for intermediate vision as well as distance, not so great on the reading, but we've put Vividy in patients with dry macular degeneration. They've been very happy and done very well. It's not a great reading lens, but it is really good to at least get you in the game so that you're at the grocery store and you can look at the label on a Purell bottle, for instance, and you can at least see most of it without pulling out the readers. So those are some lens implant options. You know, if you talk to 100 friends that have had cataract surgery, they will all tell you, don't be nervous. The surgery was a breeze, but it's the eye drops that drove us crazy. And there are three different drops. Two of them are three days before the surgery. And then you add a third one on the day of surgery after the procedure is done. And you need to be um, an expert in, at Excel spreadsheets and put down all the drops. And okay, after the first week, this one's done. And this one goes from four times to three times a day. And the next week goes to twice a day. Very confusing and the drops are very expensive. We got a call yesterday from a patient who's actually the friend of a neighbor saying that one of the three drops, and this was a patient that couldn't have our dropless surgery because of allergies. One of the three drops uh, at Walgreens was $325. She fortunately walked out the door and asked if we had an alternative, which we did. But drops are expensive, and more importantly, they just drive you crazy trying to make sure that you put them in correctly for a full month after the first eye cataract. By the way, we wait two weeks between eyes. There are some practices, very few, that do both eyes on the same day. But for us, in most practices, it's a safety issue. And we do one eye, make sure that everything goes well. And then we do the second eye. So two weeks apart. And you can imagine if you were using drops in both eyes, that's six weeks of drops with a lot of overlap and a lot of confusion. So what did we do about it in 2016? We switched to something called dropless therapy, which is the steroid and the antibiotic injected directly into the eye. It's great for people who just can't get it as far as drops go, or also that have arthritis and can't squeeze the bottle. It's not an easy thing. <clears throat> so that puts the burden on family members to have to come in and put the drops in four times a day. Um, there's just a lot of reasons to get rid of drops when it comes to cataract surgery. And so we took that step and I'm gonna show you a video of what that entails. You're seeing a cataract has been completely removed. You're seeing the lens implant in place, that shiny circular thing. And now Dr. Woodard is ready to put in the trimoxy, which is the steroid antibiotic compound. And you can see it, it's white. And as he injects it into the eye, you see this big gob of white in the center of the patient's vision. Well, how do you think they're gonna see for the next few hours?
probably not very well in this scenario. And we tell everybody that, that for the first few days, your vision isn't going to be that great, uh, but that you're going to really reap the rewards of putting up with that for a couple of days by not having to use drops for the rest of the month. Here's another patient with Trimoxy that um, when he puts it in, you're going to see the whitish steroid compound mixed with the antibiotic, but then you're going to see it kind of retract and not affect the very center of the vision. So this is a patient that more likely will see well for the first 24 hours right after the surgery. So the trimoxy is out here in the peripheral vision. You'll still notice the floaters, but it's not dead on. So a very significant advance, and you ask, why doesn't everyone do it? Well, it's because it costs us as a practice and as a surgery center money and reimbursements are down enough. And so the justification by most surgeons is if I have to spend an extra nickel, I'm not going to do it. We did for the convenience of our patients and it's been a huge hit. So let's um, sort of wrap up by saying that cataract surgery uh, is very compatible with macular degeneration, uh, especially with dry, but with wet and permission from the retinal doctors, noting that they've had enough anti-VEGF medicine put in the eye over a period of months to stabilize the eye. Uh, you can certainly uh, reap the rewards of modern day cataract surgery by experiencing at least some improvement in vision without any fear that it's going to accelerate the macular degeneration or harm your eye in any other way. Uh, this is my email address. If you have any questions that you don't want to chat about in the public chat forum. And so we've got a bunch of uh, questions. The first, what is systemic HTN? That's uh, hypertension or high blood pressure. Sorry, I get into the medical lingo. And uh, so that's just high blood pressure. Uh, can I continue to take eye vitamins before and after cataract surgery? And the answer is absolutely. If you've been prescribed an AREDS formula or any, any kind of vitamin, uh, you continue to take it. You do not have to stop it before or after the surgery. Um, how long after cataract surgery can I get injections for macular degeneration? I mean, often we'll do an injection a few weeks after, but again, that's going to be a cooperative effort and decision between the retinal doctor and the uh, cataract surgeon, and they need to communicate. And sometimes doctors don't, and it's frustrating. So asking your retinal doctor to send a letter to the cataract surgeon is very important and asking your cataract surgeon to share the results of the cataract surgery with the retinal doctor also very important as far as the timing of those injections after the surgery. Uh, let me read this one first before I read it out loud. So this is an excellent question about, um, I've heard about some issues with these special lenses that I mentioned. Um, and that's absolutely right. Uh, I don't care about wearing glasses. So what's going to give me my best vision? Great question. And I appreciate that a lot. The best distance vision is going to be with the standard monofocal lens that insurance pays for. And just because you don't have to pay out of pocket for it doesn't mean it's a lesser lens. It's an excellent lens and it gives you the best distance vision. You'll just need glasses for that computer distance on up as far as reading. Uh, if you have a fair amount of astigmatism, that answer changes a little bit because your distance vision with the standard monofocal that has not corrected the astigmatism is going to be blurred. And then you'll need a pair of transition type lenses like I'm wearing that correct the astigmatism in the distance, the intermediate and near. 
So if anyone suggests to you that you'd benefit from a toric lens, the name of the lens that corrects for astigmatism, I would not hesitate to go with a lens like that. Again, that's out of pocket money, but anywhere from 1500 to 2400 in our area, but we'll give you the best distance vision without glasses. And then you'll just have to worry about readers, but great question. The next question ties into that. Does the Vividi lens or all of these lenses, panoptics, the monofocal lens, do they last for a lifetime? And the answer is absolutely yes. We've been putting lens implants in since 1980 and the lens uh, typically does not shift. It doesn't move. It doesn't, uh, the lens itself doesn't cloud over, although that back capsule of the lens that we leave in to hold the lens implant in place, that can become cloudy. And we do a simple laser procedure, and I use the Kleenex analogy. If this is the cloudy back layer of the lens, a simple laser called the YAG pokes a hole in it, and now you have a clear window that you can see through for the rest of your life. But the lenses all last for a lifetime. Uh, very rarely we put a panoptics multifocal in a patient that doesn't like it, then you have to take it out and you do what's called a lens exchange. But these lenses you can count on being with you till death do us part. Uh, I asked my doctor about blue filter lenses, but feels they are not needed. Can I request this lens? You know, there's ultraviolet uh, filtering lenses. The UV coating is pretty much built into most lenses. Um, that's an excellent question um, that I should know the answer to, a blue blocking, because there's been a lot of discussion about blue blocking ophthalmic lenses. And you can request it, but the Question is, does your surgeon have access to it? Because most surgeons will uh, align themselves with one particular lens company. And if that company doesn't make that type of lens, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, speaking of the lenses, what are they made of? It's an acrylic material. It's uh, a foldable lens. So in the old days, it was like a hard contact lens that was this big and you had to make the space that it was going through that big in order to fit it into the eye. Now it folds like a taco, goes through a tiny incision and then opens up inside the eye. So that acrylic material is very inert. It does not uh, interact in any negative way with the inside of the eye, even though the inside of the eye has never seen a material like that. There's no inflammation, there's no rejection like you'd see with a corneal transplant when you're putting someone else's tissue onto your eye. Great questions. Thank you so much. Uh, would having high myopia, degenerative myopia, make me more susceptible to cataract surgery complications? I developed TAS post-op. So TAS is um, a toxic syndrome from residual cleaning materials that are baked onto instruments. And it causes this inflammation that almost looks like an infection, the most dreaded complication of cataract surgery called endophthalmitis. That really has nothing to do with the high myopia. We do like retinal doctors to clear our patients with very high myopia because what can happen after cataract surgery is that you could be at higher risk for a tear or a detachment. So we get all of our very high nearsighted patients cleared by retina so that we, we at least had a second opinion that we were okay going forward with the cataract surgery. TAS is a, a totally different matter. And you rarely see outbreaks of it, but when you do, you'll have three or four patients with it on the same day, and it can be counteracted with topical steroids and injections, et cetera. Uh, 
I mentioned that cataract surgery does not make macular degeneration worse. What if the patient never had macular degeneration? Does the cataract surgery cause it? And I'm sorry, I tried to answer that, but I apparently didn't do a very good job. No, the cataract surgery has nothing to do with causing a new case of macular degeneration. So you can rest assured and take that one to the bank. Again, I wanna thank you because I've done a lot of webinars over this shutdown and I usually get one or two or three questions from my colleagues and here you all are asking fabulous questions. Um, <clears throat> So I had cataract surgery recently on my eye with wet macular degeneration. And my retina doctor said that the macular degeneration was stabilized. That's excellent. And he's been injecting ILEA. After cataract surgery, my near vision is much better. I am scheduled to have surgery on the other eye October 4th. I do hope that it will improve my distance vision. And again, I'm thinking that the judgment of your, both your surgeons, cataract and retina, is that there's enough of a cataract there that like your first eye, uh, taking out the cataract will eliminate that cloud, that filter, and will allow you to see better. And good luck on the fourth. And can cataract surgery finally, uh, final question, ever be redone especially if it wasn't successful initially. So that's one of those questions I'm gonna to have to waffle on because I'd need a lot of details and you're more than welcome to, to email me. But um, it depends on what part of the surgery wasn't successful. Typically doing it over, well, first of all, once you take out the lens, you've technically done the cataract surgery so you can never redo it. But if it has to do with the lens implant, either tilted the wrong way or um, sinking down or up or east or west, uh, the lens can be repositioned. But there's a broad category of unsuccessful cataract surgeries. Um, luckily, they're definitely in the minority. Most people go through this surgery with flying colors. It's the number one outpatient procedure done in the United States, and I wouldn't hesitate to do it. Just do your research, and don't be afraid to ask your surgeon how many surgeries have they done. There are plenty of general ophthalmologists that do one or two or five a week. Um, my surgeon does 100 a week. We're not bragging about that except to say that if you do 100 of anything versus five of anything a week, you're going to get better at it if you're the one in the 100 category. So you want to talk to people that have had surgery at that particular, by that surgeon at that surgery center, make sure the experience is going to be a good one with a very positive outcome. With that, I'm going to thank you all so much for your attention and your wonderful questions. And I hope I've been of some assistance to um, those on the call today. Thank you to Dusty. Thank you to Andrea. Um, thank you, uh, all of you, for uh, your participation today and best wishes. And thank you, Dr. Jamian. We really appreciate you bringing your uh, vast amount of knowledge of the subject matter to our uh, listeners today and for the uh, very informative, if not sometime uh, terrifying videos. So we appreciate you so much. We would now like to. Uh, introduce you to uh, Dr. Blemker. Dr. Blemker is a ocular disease residency trained optometrist who's practiced in Nashville, Tennessee area for nine years before transitioning to industry. She was an executive clinical outcome specialist for Bausch & Lohm Surgical for four years prior to joining the Notel team a little over three years ago, where she serves as director of clinical affairs and professional relations. Dr. Blemker, you have our attention. Thank you so much for the introduction. No Television is proud to partner with the Macular Degeneration Association, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. It is such a privilege. To reiterate some of the important points made in the presentation, 
I'd like to further discuss understanding the importance of early detection of wet AMD and how you can play a role in protecting your vision. 4C Home is FDA cleared and Medicare covered. It's prescribed by your eye care professional when you have the appropriate level of vision and appropriate stage of age-related macular degeneration. It's a form of personalized medicine with the 4C Home device used at home in between your regular eye exams and it detects metamorphopsia or visual distortions in AMD. AMD is the leading cause of severe central vision loss in people over the age of 50 years in the United States. I'm going to share with you the information you need to get informed and take charge of your vision. AMD is a chronic, meaning it doesn't resolve or go away, progressive, meaning it tends to worsen over time type of condition. And there are two types of AMD, dry and wet. Dry AMD is the slower changing earlier form of the disease that's, that puts you at risk for developing the wet form of AMD. And wet AMD is the sudden change or advanced form of the disease. AMD affects an area of the retina called the macula, which is responsible for detailed central vision used for activities like reading, driving, and seeing faces clearly. In dry AMD, changes occur in the cells of the macula and drusen or deposits, these yellow spots that you see here on the right side of the screen in the picture, build up in this area. And these changes may induce blurry vision, such as difficulty seeing sharp details, both up close and far away. Dry AMD is the slow form of the disease with changes you may not notice over time. Most importantly, Dry AMD puts you at an increased risk of progressing to wet AMD. Over time, the size and number of these drusen or deposits can increase, which increases your risk of developing the more sight-threatening form, wet AMD. Again, dry AMD can suddenly change to wet AMD without any kind of advance notice. If you convert to wet AMD, abnormal blood vessels grow under and into the retina in the macula as you'll see here on the right side of the screen. These blood vessels can leak fluid and they can sometimes bleed without any type of warning. You may not notice these changes until significant vision loss has occurred. If you convert to wet AMD, this significant vision loss can be rapid and severe. Symptoms of wet AMD include distortion where straight lines look wavy. You can have dark spots in your vision or just generalized blurry vision as you see here on the screen. Unlike dry AMD, there are effective treatments for wet AMD, but these treatments are most effective when administered early on before symptoms are noticed and before vision loss has occurred. These treatments can halt or slow the progression of wet AMD, but they cannot restore vision that's already been lost. Once the wet disease starts, it will continue to advance until you receive treatment. Irreversible damage can occur within days to weeks and before symptoms are even noticed. But how early is early detection? Once symptoms of visual impairment are noticed, those wavy lines or dark spots appear in your vision, then the vision loss may have already occurred. The earlier you catch wet AMD, the better chance you have of preserving your vision, your independence, and the ability to go about your daily life participating in activities you enjoy. So, Wet AMD treatments are most effective when the disease is caught early. 4C Home is an early warning system for your eyes. You use this device at home in between your regular eye exams. It helps people with dry AMD detect wet AMD before you even notice that visual changes have occurred. But how does it work? Well, you take a simple daily test that checks for tiny changes in your vision. The test takes just a few minutes per eye per day. The data from each test is then sent to your eye doctor as well as the Notal Vision Diagnostic Clinic, the medical provider of 4C Home. If a change in test scores is detected, the diagnostic clinic alerts your doctor. Your doctor's office will then contact you directly to schedule a follow-up visit. The AMSA grid, as you see here on the left side of the screen, was developed in the 1940s and has for a long time been recommended as a simple and accessible tool that you can use from home to monitor the changes in your vision. However, by the time you notice vision distortions on this AMSR grid, significant vision loss may have already occurred. 
Fortunately, new technology such as the Forceum AMD monitoring program has been developed so you can detect tiny changes before symptoms are noticed and the system reports them to your doctor so you can receive immediate examination and treatment if necessary. Testing with 4C Home is easy. You turn the device on and look into the viewfinder to begin testing. Then a bump will briefly appear and disappear, as you can see here in the center green circle on the screen. You'll use the mouse provided to click where the bump appeared and then return to this center dot. Data from each test is then sent to the Notel Vision Diagnostic Clinic for evaluation and provided to your eye doctor as well. Regular at-home monitoring is like brushing your teeth. It's just a good healthy habit you do every day to help preserve your vision. 4C Home allows you to take a proactive approach to protect your vision. A clinical partner will be with you every step of the way. After the Notel Vision Diagnostic Clinic receives a referral from your doctor, we'll answer any questions, verify coverage, and ship your device. Once you receive the device, the Notel Vision Diagnostic Clinic will walk you through setup and training. You and your doctor will continue to receive feedback from the Notel Vision Diagnostic Clinic. Our team will be sure to verify your insurance benefits and discuss with you prior to your acceptance of the device and prior to getting started with the program. There are low out-of-pocket costs for Medicare patients, so patients with Medicare and a secondary supplement plan could have out-of-pocket costs as low as $0 per month. Patients with Medicare and no secondary supplement plan will pay $15.06 per month once their yearly Medicare fee-for-service Part B deductible is met. Again, 4C Home is FDA cleared and Medicare covered. Your doctor will send our No Television Diagnostic Clinic the order for you to begin the 4C Home AMD monitoring program. And appropriate candidates have a particular stage of dry AMD and a particular level of vision, which will be determined by your doctor. You'll continue to test regularly at home. If a change takes place, your doctor will be alerted and have you come in for an examination. In summary, the No Television Diagnostic Clinic works with your doctor to remotely monitor your dry AMD, helping you retain functional vision throughout your AMD journey. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, and thank you so much. Here's my contact information for your reference. I would love to hear from you. Excellent. I see some questions rolling in. Let me pull those up here. The first one is, I am not very tech savvy. Will I need training to use this device? As far as the technical aspects of testing at home with 4C Home, you'll just be able to use the mouse that's included. So clicking with your index finger, it's attached to the device. You'll receive that whenever it's shipped to you. Um, as far as training on this device, we have an entire team of professionals who are able to go through the steps with you, help troubleshoot any questions that you might have, and just take as much time as you need. Um, this is all done, of course, remotely on the phone at your convenience, but everything will be reviewed with you to make sure that you're comfortable actually taking the test and using the mouse um, to click when appropriate whenever you're using 4C Home. The next one says, I have dry AMD in one eye and wet in the other. Can I still use this? Absolutely. And I know as Dr. Ajamian had mentioned in the presentation, the risk of one eye versus both eyes converting to wet AMD, we see oftentimes that if your first eye has converted to wet AMD from the dry form, then there is a little bit higher risk that your fellow eye, the other eye, will convert to wet AMD. So definitely we want to help protect that second eye the one that's still dry. And if that conversion takes place, then detect earlier and be able to get you to treatment earlier to help save your vision. Can I get results from these daily tests? So when you're finished performing the test every day, the, the device, the system will just turn off. So you won't see anything on the screen as far as feedback or numbers or anything like that that appears. 
This information does go to our monitoring center, it goes to the cloud, and then your doctor has access to this information on a regular basis. What you will receive is if there's been a change that is significant that the artificial intelligence analyzes, sends to the monitoring center and then to your doctor, then you'll hear from your doctor about potentially coming in for examination to look at your eyes and review the results. Otherwise, what you'll hear from us at the No Television Monitoring Center is you'll receive regular communications about how you're doing, uh, your compliance, your adherence to the program. And of course, you can always call us at any point in time. If you have any questions about monitoring with the service, we're always happy to answer. What happens if I miss a few days due to a vacation? Well, um, there are options for you as far as taking the device with you. It is approved for that. As far as travel is concerned, air travel, it comes in a nice little soft carrying case. Um, and since it's not very heavy, you can certainly take the device with you. Um, another option is if you're going to be unable to take the device with you and you won't be able to test for an extended period of time, we can put a pause on your account. We can have the start and stop dates for when you are not able to test. And then our team would know that and we would know as far as deactivating then reactivating the service um, depending on your schedule needs. Do you have to do software updates like we do on our smartphones? Great question. Um, of course, we always want to stay up to date with the latest and greatest as far as technology and transmission of the tests. But as far as your responsibilities, you would not have any. We would take care of all of that for you remotely so we can send to the device any updates that they might need. And if there's anything outside of that as far as technical support that you would like to have, then again, we have an entire team that would take care of that for you. So rest assured that we'd be able to um, support in that regard. Next, it says here, my hand strength is not like it was, and I feel it may not be accurate because of not pushing the button in time. This is actually a relatively common concern. Thank you so much for this question. I think it's important to bring up because um, the way the system is, is designed is that when you're looking into the viewer and you're looking at the lines with the bumps that appear, that stimulus or that line with the bump will only appear for a very brief second. But the time that you need to go from that center dot to where you think you saw the bump, you can take as much time as you need. So there's no worry about getting over to where the stimulus was quickly. The device understands that sometimes we just need a little bit more time to make that happen. And so it will take that into account and you can just take as much time as you need. I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Blumker for uh, joining us today and giving us great information, answering these questions for us. Have a great day.